welcome to the four, the set of videos on the fourth um, chunk of readings from Aristotle. These videos are going to be concerned with physics, book two, chapters four through nine. Um, and in these videos, we're going to return to this distinction between the mechanists and the teleologists um, that we saw back when we looked at Plato in Plato's education, or sorry, um, Socrates and Socrates's education. Remember that the mechanists thought that all appeals to final causes, um, that for the sake of witches, um, should be banished from natural philosophy, right? So all appeal to um, purposes, goods, aims, ends, all of that should be banned from natural philosophy, according to the mechanists. Whereas the teleologists, they think, no, 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 there are some things in nature that act, act for the sake of other things, and you can't explain why they're causing what, they, what they're causing, or why they're responsible for what they're responsible for, um, or how they're acting, how they're interacting with other things, unless you appeal to final causes, that for the sake of which they're doing what they do. Um, and so in, in these passages, um, we're going to end up seeing how Aristotle would sort of respond to a view like Darwin's. Um, and, um, and so in particular, remember, Plato and Aristotle, they were both teleologists. They both thought, no, you have to appeal to final causes, that for the sake of which um, purposes in order to explain certain things in the natural world. Um, but Aristotle's twist on the teleological explanation, on teleological explanation, is he held that there was no divine creator that intends beneficial arrangements. So beneficial arrangements are going to be arrangements um, that, uh, that are for the sake of something or seem to be for the sake of something. So for example, we're made up of systems of parts that work together to ensure our proper function as wholes. So my heart pumps my blood, um, which goes to my lungs. My lungs then um, oxygenate that blood and that oxygenated blood gets circulated around my body and brings oxygen you know, to the various parts of my body. Um, and so my body makes up a system. My body makes up a system um, that has parts, and those parts work together with one another to ensure that the whole body all together is healthy, right? So my body functions as a whole. Um, and, and, and so there's a kind of beneficial arrangement among the parts of my body so as to ensure that my whole body works well, my whole body functions. And um, we can sort of dig into this a little more by recognizing that the parts of a body, of an organic body, of an organism, are organs. And in Greek, organ or organon, those were words for a tool. So in Greek, organ or organon just meant tool. So a hammer would be an organ, a saw would be an organ, et cetera, right? Because they're tools. And tools have functions. Tools have functions. So for example, a hammer is for hammering nails. Um, and um, each function of the organs in a body um, is, is, is for a certain task, right? My, my heart is for pumping blood. That's the function that my heart has. Or my, my lungs are for oxygenating blood. That's the function that my lungs have. Um, and so each of the functions of the argue, organs, you know, each of the organs has their own function and um, each of the functions of the organ is regulated by the good that it's supposed to do for the whole organism, right? So, so each organ has a function, um, and each of the functions of the organs um, is regulated by the place of the organ 
in the whole organism and the way that that organ contributes to the good of the whole organism. And then the question arises, well, okay, if that's how organisms work, they eat, they have all of these parts that work together so as to ensure that the whole organism functions well. So all of the parts work for the sake of the others in order to maintain the whole. Well, perhaps these beneficial arrangements of organs also happen on a larger scale. So maybe not just, maybe there's these kind of beneficial arrangements, not just within organisms, but within nature as a whole. So maybe there's these kind of beneficial arrangements um, between say, the way the stars rotate or whatever, how the seasons um, come into existence and pass out of existence, when the rains come, um, how the rains nurture the crops, how the crops grow and feed animals, um, et cetera, right? And so Plato is going to think that there are these large-scale beneficial arrangements, but Plato thinks that this has all been ordered by some mind, some divine rational being that's created the universe as it is and made this large scale order of beneficial arrangements. But Aristotle, remember, doesn't think that there's any kind of divine creator. He, he holds there isn't a divine all-knowing being that created the universe. And so there's this question, well, does Aristotle think that nature as a whole consists in these beneficial arrangements? I mean, could Aristotle hold this? Could he believe that in nature we find all sorts of beneficial arrangements and yet deny that the divine creator intended the universe to be so? Well, <clears throat> we'll turn to that question in the next video. Um, but before we do, really, really the video after the next video. Um, but before we do, um, let's look briefly at the view that's going to be under consideration for the rest of um, these videos uh, today. Um, this is a view that comes forward at 198 B 15 to 35. So this is in chapter eight of book two of the physics. Um, and it's, it's the second paragraph in chapter eight. It's the second paragraph in chapter eight. Um, and so let's read it because um, this is going to present the view that Aristotle is going to be arguing against. So this is Aristotle's target. And this is what Aristotle says. The problem thus arises. Why should we suppose that nature acts for something and because it is better? Why should not everything be like the rain? Zeus does not send the rain in order to make the corn grow. It comes of necessity. The stuff which has been up, drawn up is bound to cool, and having cooled, turn to water and come down. It is merely concurrent that, this having happened, the corn grows. Similarly, if someone's corn rots on the threshing floor, it does not rain for this purpose that the corn may rot, but that that came about concurrently. What then is to stop parts of nature too from being like this, the front teeth of necessity growing sharp and suitable for biting, and the back teeth broad and serviceable for chewing food, not coming to be for this, but by coincidence. And similarly, with the other parts in which the for something seems to be present. So when all turned out just as if they had come to be for something, then the things suitably constituted as an automatic outcome survived. When not, they died and die, as Empedocles says of the man-headed cats. Okay. So what's going on here is Aristotle is asking, well, if you think about the rain, the rain doesn't come about for the sake of something. It doesn't come about through a kind of final causation. 
it's not created by Zeus in order to in order to bring something else about, in order for their some to be some further final cause. No, the rain comes of necessity when it comes. Um, and it's not for the sake of something else. But are other things in nature just like that? Can we account for everything in nature just like that? I mean, um, can uh, the parts in nature too from being like this? So the front teeth of necessity growing sharp, right? So can, can animals come to form jaws um, in the way that the rain just rains, right? Um, or are jaws for the sake of eating? Do jaws come into existence for the sake of eating, um, for chewing food, right? Um, or is it possible that they come to be not for the sake of chewing food, but just by accident, just by a kind of accident? Um, and similarly with the, the other parts, which are for something, i.e., the things that come about for the sake of a final cause. Could those two have come about by a mere coincidence? Well, Empedocles thought this. So Empedocles had this weird view where organisms just kind of sprouted from the ground every once in a while. And you would get these kind of um, beings with various organs smushed together in various ways. So you would get man-headed calves or, um, uh, uh, you know, hearts and livers sprouting out together at once without anything else around them or um, um, jaws and feet um, together, but nothing else, um, et cetera, right? So you get these sort of like monstrous um, conglomerations of organs and <clears throat> the monstrous conglomerations of organs that, you know, didn't have jaws for chewing food um, would end up dying, right? So if they, did, if they couldn't eat, um, well, then they would die away. And so on Empedocles' view, you'd have these sort of periods where organisms sprouted up out of the ground, um, and then they'd kind of, all the ones that couldn't survive would just die out, and then the ones that were left over, you know, would reproduce and go on and, and, and create the plants and the animals, etc. And so on Empedocles' view, jaws come about merely by coincidence. And so this is the view that Aristotle wants to examine. He thinks this is the serious view that we should pay attention to. Um, you know, why isn't it that things work like this? That's what he's going to, that's what he's going to be interested in. And that's what we're going to be looking at in the next few videos.